on yeah, it's on Mac. Yeah. Actually, you know, actually, the idea of uh, using the follow program. We used the hammer to repair by Color TV, and uh, it worked for a few seconds. Um, so um, the outline is uh, quite simple. We need data sets with gold standards. We need more realistic uh, attack scenarios. We need improved classification for PPRL. Uh, many things I don't understand will Peter talk about. <laughs> uh, PPL and multiple databases the next thing. We need um, more metrics for privacy and for uh, quality and completeness. Uh, as I mentioned in this morning, we need a systematic evaluation of encoding and hardening methods. And uh, actually, we have no systematic approach to missing data, which in practice is one of the most uh, pressing problems. And um, we need something we have to present to someone who really needs a PPRL solution in practice, and they need it now and not in five years. And uh, whatever that is, and even if it's uh, certified 581, it would be better than nothing. Uh, so um, obviously, uh, we need we need a standard problem for uh, comparing different PPRL solutions and. As it mentioned, has been mentioned many times before, um, um, real data is really weird, and the, the data corruptors are too friendly to us. I think uh, uh, you see much weirder things in, in reality than, than in the corrupted data sets, and uh, access to to real data is uh, really, really, really problematic. Um, um, as I live in Germany, access to nearly everything is impossible. Uh, even uh, access to records of dead people is close to impossible. Uh, um, I need more, more than a year to get access to records of dead people. Um, and um, another problem uh, uh, that is due to our experience with the last census data set, uh, I had a chance to have a look at the real census data set used for, for linkage, and um, something you see there is um, intentional obfuscation. People modify intentionally small variations of their identifiers uh, just to prevent exactly that the thing what we are doing, and we need research on that. And there's, so far as I see in PPR, there's no research on, on mildly intentional obfuscation. This is maybe something about Australia. So in Australia, we have the, the issue of aboriginals, uh, migrants, and cultures. And often studies um, are about these subgroups of the population. And in general, we know about this. They are, we cannot simulate those. All the data generators do not include these and, and distributions of, of what, what are mistakes people make when they type in these names or record these things. Right? So, but this, are exactly the kind of subpopulations where the government is interesting, closing the gap, for example. So how do we improve um, the life expectancy of Aboriginal people? So we have exactly well, we have similar problems. Um, and even the ABS, if they do tests in order, tests of the linkages, um, or when when Rubenstein unfortunately not here, they had, they kind of looked at privacy preserving linkages in the census, and they didn't consider these subpopulations, which much harder to link. Um, you don't get clean Aboriginal names. Right? You don't get clean Arabic names or clean Sri Lankan names. There are there's so many different variations. Right? So we can clean and standardize the Millers and the Smith and the Williams. But we cannot clean all these multicultural names. So, so getting these subpopulations is really challenging. And these are the populations which we cannot link. And there might be a link to the last talk because <laughs> because uh, uh, um, the quality of the linkage is dependent on on the classification and of the entity resolution, and and therefore assuming independence is easy for developing bounds I think, but in in practice uh, uh, it will not happen because there are systematic relations to uh, the things we are interested in and the quality of the identifiers we have. Just, 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 just quick comment on that, right? So for the indig indigenous people, it's quite bad because the banks can't even do their KYC on that population, and that means that they are an underbanked population in Australia. 
and that's actually a very serious problem that they're in the time of Seoul. So even before the linkage, the first step of establishing identity is still yeah. very hard to have a problem. Okay. Um, we need more realistic uh, attack scenarios. Nearly everything in PPRL is based on the HVSC assumption, and this is more or less due to the fact that that's the only existing model which is really well defined. Um, uh, the next line is yours. Mm -hmm. is the third line is uh, yours. Ah, mm. oh, yeah, so there are computers that we could always have looked at more. So we have the underscore curious models, we have the malicious model. Um, there are two approaches in between. There's been a few papers. One is called the covert model, and one is called the cabinet computing. And I think Tillinan must know about this because he looked into those. They kind of allow you to do privacy preserving calculations and, and find what's the likelihood that the party is cheating. Right? <coughs> That's something which is more, uh, which is maybe <coughs> more realistic, right? So in in like in a government a, in a government environment, HPC might work, right? So if the ABS is linking data with Medicare, the organizations are not going to cheat. Um, but as soon as you have commercial a commercial environment where you might have banks and pharmaceutical companies, there might be um, some incentive to try to learn more than just what they should like. So where we have to kind of look at other parties behaving in the way they should. But again, there's almost no work has been done in these new kind of models. Um, yeah. Yeah, just, just to repeat, for practical relevance, uh, uh, as mentioned before, uh, attacking humans is much easier. And a um, uh, uh, really nice example was the large data breach in, in Singapore. Uh, um, uh, there's <coughs> the database owner and the linkage unit uh, uh, chief uh, has uh, some, done some really strange things. And uh, nothing, really nothing on earth could prevent that kind of attacks. And uh, so we need something more serious um, uh, as attack scenarios. And uh, we have written a research grant to the German Research Foundation, and we expect their decision uh, to do that. That's uh, the collaboration between a social scientist and a cryptographer. And, uh, uh, it applies to two fields, and uh, I'm not too optimistic uh, <laughs> concerning the uh, reviews. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Peter? That's my side. Okay. I mentioned this before, right? So, at the, or I think I told some of you over lunch. So, we all assume that single similarity threshold we have, right? And that's except your machine learning kind of approach. Right? But if you look at normal machine learning data mining, they have much more complex uh, learning models. They are supervised. Um, classifiers or even unsupervised, we often use much more information than a single similarity. We can use individual attribute similarities. Right? And there, has been, there has been lots of work in privacy preserving data mining, again, horizontally or vertically partitioned data, but nothing has really been looked at in privacy preserving record linkage. In general, record linkage or entity resolution has been quite a bit of work in the last 10 years on collective entity resolution, relational learning where we look at relationships between records. Um, for example, again, lots of that work has been done on bibliographic data because that's publicly available. If you know kind of how many kind of relationships um, between papers and authors and venues, then you can use that information and nothing has to be done in PPR. Everybody has everybody kind of concentrates um, on the encoding at the simi the similarities done on bit vectors or if you have another encoding, you do a privacy preserving similarity calculation. But there has to be much more work in kind of looking at how do we do, how do you find the, not only how do you find the best threshold, can we do more? We need to have more than just one similarity. Um, because if you, if you ever do a real linkage and you just do a histogram of your similarities, there's just not enough information to make a really good informed decision to get. We've done that with NCBR, we've done it with other data sets, and literally you're going to have whatever similarity threshold you're taking, 0.9 if it's normalized, you're always going to have half of them are going to be no matches, um, just because the way you link the data is together. So it, you need something better. <laughs> and I'm not sure what 
best way to do it. it can be used kind of because in a way what we're doing is the, the linkage that even the probability term linkage that gives us a similarity graph. So we have the nodes are being records and we have a similarity in what? And depending on the linkage situation, it's a one to one link, it's a one to many, the duplication, etc. There's more information in these similarity graphs, right? It's not just classifying if an integral pair is a link or not, it's much more. Next slide is also yours. Mm -hmm. you know, um, the multiple database thing, again, that's something we're working on. Most of um, the dynamic and temporal data, most for even just a normal record link, you just looked at. You have two databases, they're static, they're collected at the same point of time where there's no temporal information, but that's not reality. Right? Reality is increasingly dynamic databases. We have streams of query records, talking about uh, commercial transactional data, right? Even government is moving towards online services where you have to do identity checks in real time, things like this. Um, we have several databases we want to link together. We can't just do pairwise linkage between every pair of databases, it doesn't make sense. Um, so it's done with the work with solution that is telling us PhDs on this. How do we scale things up? How do we find matches in subset of these databases? So again, Ron, you mentioned the 1800 hospitals. What about if I want to find everybody who's visited 20 hospitals last year, right? Where do these people move around? Right? How do I find every patient out of a subset of 20 out of 1,800 hospitals? Right? Computationally, it's, it's huge. Right? As we have more hospitals, well, no, as we have more, as we have more parties, uh, and again, if, if you go to the commercial space, then the likelihood of collusion increases. Right? There are certain parties working together in order to identify information from another party. So that's, again, if you have two parties, that's much less of a problem. How do we link dynamic data? We look at temporal data. How do we link data streams? Right? If, if we have a we have a stream of query records, um, and maybe a certain bank doesn't want to give us their names and addresses, they might be happy to give us some form of encoding to check if somebody has done some bad credit history or something. Um, so these are again technical problems, but they're still in in the way the big data era works. And I just have to mention a nice example beneath the 1800 hospitals. In, in the UK, every patient should be registered to exactly one GP, and the empirical maximum is 50. That's one of the big open questions. I think several PhDs in there. So we have no idea how good our linkages are from the retro linkage because we. We have bloom filters, we calculate similarities, we get a threshold. In practice, I mean, in a, in a research setting, yes, we have ground truth data. Um, in practice, how do we do this, right? Let's say we have the ABS, we have Medicare, they want to link stuff together, nobody is prepared to give any information away. What are we going to have at the end? Well, are we going to have a certain number of matches? And then what? Um, if I'm going to show you five records, James, are you going to give me show five of your records? So how are we going to do this? Right? So um, how, how many classified matches are true matches? How many, what's the completeness? Um, how do we do this? There has been one or two papers by uh, Hachim Kung um, on this, she called the privacy preserving interactive record linkage, right? So where that manual clerical review is done partially masked information we, we had some ideas when she took the poster with me and we actually submitted the paper once where you again need some pattern mining to try to identify patterns which are frequently not uh, and we can reveal these patterns. The readers didn't like it at all. They didn't understand what we were doing. We were still trying to understand what we wanted to do. But I think that's really important, right? Again, from a practical perspective, I guess James will be comments on that. Right? If you cannot validate how good your linkage is, nobody will use that stuff. You know, like the same problem exists in clear tape links. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so we can solve this for one, you've solved it for both. Okay, so, so I, I still have a problem that when you do linkage, like, you want to report back what the quality is yeah. to the analysts so that they can adjust for that in the studies that they're doing. Yeah. And even when I talk about this to people who do clear tape linkage, they still have no clue how to do it. Right, okay. So that's a bit much bigger problem than yeah. that. So, uh, I think we may like, talk about some of this this morning. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, what? Like, continue. Okay. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you measure privacy? Any idea? This, we, don't, we don't have accuracy, precision, recall, and all these things. We don't have a single exact measure of privacy. And I don't think we need one. I mean, again, we have differential privacy which gives us some numerical values for us. With the new shell, we looked at it's in a specific area of privacy, which is record linkage disclosure risk. But what's the likelihood if I have an encoded record, boom, fill through? And with some mechanism, I can link that back to one plain text value, then I get a one to one disclosure risk. Right? If I can link that back to 100 records, I get a one in 100 disclosure risk. Right? So there, but there is not one signal. Again, at the end of the day, people have to take a number, right? That's why they want the F measure of accuracy. I want to tell James, if you do this linkage, you have a privacy of 0 0.95. How do we do this? So my, my sense is that, I mean, the two sets of, the two slides, this slide and the previous one, they're connected. They are connected, but actually they cannot be answered in isolation. So you do the linkage for a purpose. So in the, in the context of that purpose, there's some utility that you want to measure, and in those things, then you make a trade-off between privacy and linkage quality, right? So, I tell you, give me a, a measure. How do you measure privacy? How do you actually measure it? Right? It's, is it the disclosure risk? Is it if I have, can you assume that I have access to a plain text database and I have the encoded database? How do I measure this? How do I tell the ABS if the risk is of re-identification? What? The probability of re-identification. That's what we, that's what we kind of, People didn't really like it, nobody's using it. Right? But yeah, just ask, ask Richard for me. <laughs> 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 and again, I think it's from a practice I was trying to develop that as practical use, but I, if we were to tell it to the ABS so, or tax office or whatever, they want to, at the end, they want to have something like, give me a number between zero and one. I, I think they want to have 100% secure private rights. That's what cryptographers want. But in practice, Maybe there's a slight risk, right? So if, if you have different options for different algorithms, then it's a trade of us between privacy and utility. So of course you have the computational sources and all this kind of thing. I think there's still lots of research to be done, maybe not just within the privacy preserving record language community, but more general about privacy preserving machine learners, data miners, whatever, right? Um, as well as that, the disclosure risk, people like Mark Elliott and statisticians who work in the world as well. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, that's more or less uh, a summary of the things I've said this morning. We have quite a different, or uh, quite a large number of suggestions for privacy preserving record linkage methods, for hardening methods, but we have no systematic comparison. And uh, the existing ones, usually in the introduction of the papers, are straw man comparisons yeah. and, and uh, there's no systematic research combining all known principles. Um, uh, missing data is a central problem in, in, in practical applications. Uh, we have no solution for that. Uh, there, is, uh, there are some ad hoc procedures. We know for sure that the ad hoc procedures will uh, open new methods for a tech, but that hasn't been studied, it's not mentioned in the literature. And um, since uh, whatever we suggest in practice, it will be applied to, to problems with missing data. And uh, given the ad hoc procedures that will follow, the text will be much easier, and there's no study on that. Uh, from a practical point of view, we cannot expect that the data custodians or the lawyers will uh, do the necessary evaluation of the techniques themselves. Uh, so they rely on official certifications and uh, um, can give you a nice example from the German cancer registries. Of course, we have not one cancer registry, so then we have 16 independent cancer registries and they use a certified method for linkage which is more or less a collection of uh, MD5 hashes of soundex transformed strings and of course it can be attacked and we mentioned that it can be attacked to the certification uh, agency and they said yeah we know it can be attacked 
but no one actually will do it. And uh, but this is considered a standard, and therefore it is widely used. And we need something for something more modern than uh, an MD5 uh, hash of SoundX, uh, or even that. If we have an international recommendation certification for a 581, that's better than nothing. And uh, at least from our point of view, it's better than nothing. And uh, we have no idea how to get anything certified by whom. Even the identification who would certify that would be first step. Yeah, okay, I'm going to ask you really, okay, a really important aspect. No way how the people like you actually do linkage in a way to certify techniques. Okay, for this we need to solve all the other problems first, you know, like privacy measures, uh, the evaluation of things, um, I mean, everything is so data dependent, and then policy dependent, and regulation dependent. Yeah. I was just going to say, uh, Ian, who was in before, is the secretary of the JTC1 working group on data sharing standards. Sorry. Yeah, so he's up. Uh, and that's just still at the investigative stage, but there's a broad agreement between the parties that there is a need for over, overall standard for how parties can do data sharing. Yeah. But part of that could be something around standardisation on record linkage. But you'd need to have some experts on the panel to make a recommendation that that goes into the standard process, and then it turns into either an IEC or an ISO standard. Yeah. And that's that would be the place to have such a standard. Well, I think it's way too early because we're still debating what kind of hardening techniques you But if you're talking about the <laughs> option is standardizing to SLK 581, we've got a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's it from our side. Mm. This is from your side. Did you miss anything? Yeah, can I add to the linkage quality? Um, there's also an ethical angle to this um, because Linkage is usually the beginning of a process where you want to do a, a, analytics on, on joint data sets. And if, if your linkage, linkage errors only affect a certain subgroup of the population, yeah, then you get um, weird side effects, let, let's put it that way. And, and so is there a way to ensure that the errors are evenly distributed, uh, distributed over all the different subgroups in the data set? That's the interesting topic. And, this, again, the interesting thing is, again, from when they, we had that six-month program in Cambridge, um, to my knowledge, from the machine learning work you're doing, is a guy called um, Harvey Goldstein who, in Bristol, and I think probably was close to retirement, and he's, he's a statistician. He's the only person I know who actually has looked at how to quantify linkage error and how to try to take linkage error and all the biases and everything into the next step of analysis. Worldwide, it's a massive problem. People link, have a link data set and give it to somebody else and tell them it's linked, it's all 100% correct, right? Which of course it's not right. I think there's so many studies coming out from this data where maybe, maybe. they don't know what the linkage errors are, they don't understand the techniques. I think, but even technically, how do you are you attaching just simply a link probability or confidence to every link? Is that going to be enough? Um, everything you do from standardization to blocking, comparison, and reference is far more quality. Um, there are some more. Are some others which, there yeah. are some, some other people working on, on, on linkage errors. Okay. Uh, uh, no in econometrics, it's uh, RIDA. Uh, uh, the econometrics of data linkage. Okay. Data Fusion, Handbook of Econometrics. Then there's um, uh, Chris Kinner from Southampton and um, Ray Chambers from Wollongong. Yeah. And uh, oh, uh, uh, as usual, uh, you're only world famous in one town. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um, in, in statistics, that's an old joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's in a, it's in a statistician in a way there's almost no cross yep. collaboration across the disciplines. Um, and even, yeah, I mean, I know about Chris and, and Ray, but all the details and, and they don't seem to talk to, to 
computer sound tests, and so it's kind of really stuck. We still have these silos, right? And that's the record of the yeah. Interestingly, the stuff that Harvey was doing, James Dolly H and Katie Harren yeah. and yeah. UCL and Bristol, some of the stuff that we've been doing, and, and it comes to that point about using one linkage strategy, the way you combine the information with one threshold for the whole population. So we've been thinking that if subpopulations give different levels of error, should you not use a different linkage strategy for different subgroups of the population? So tailor your strategy for the subgroups. Yeah. 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 If you can identify the subpopulation and you think you're going to get a different result, then use a different strategy. So if, if you have the grant for well, yeah, so yeah. well, if you know that, for example, in the study you're going to do that males and females the exact are different, should you use the same strategy? <laughs> no. so. We can predict that from yeah. other variables. Exactly. What about um, automation and like more machine learning approaches as opposed to just picking a threshold but applying a more data-driven approach to the linkage itself? Yeah. Uh, again, I guess it comes back to do you have some form of ground truth? I mean, one thing, given we never get, okay, realistically, we never get ground truth, right? I've been working in there for 20 years, and right from the beginning, can we get data sets, can we get data sets? And normally you talk to lawyers, and I still remember a meeting with lawyers when they argued for one single word for an hour <laughs> about um, the word research. Yes or no in a contract. I said, okay, that's it. I'm not <laughs> ever, ever going to do any collaborations with commercial companies anymore. Um, become a very confused in my next life. But even realistically, we never got a ground truth, real ground truth. That's unless you work with data custodians in a safe environment, the next five, ten years, you're not going to get problems. And even they don't do that. So, it's actually, what we, were look, what we were looking at is kind of active learning thing, to right? so where within a, an environment you kind of find the difficult cases, somehow manually classify them and over time you build. And even the ABS are looking at these kind of things, right? So it's kind of, the realization is that even for them it's sometimes difficult to get one. So it's a clerical review kind of improves that into the linkage and use more clever machine learning things. So, so automating things is definitely something which we have to do because data sets get larger, pressure to link them much faster, right? So um, but again I don't think you can get a fully automated link. It would be nice. So but it's challenging that case. So I the data linkage units do have you know human linked data with That's review right. process yeah. that and good records of how they which things have been reviewed and, and what the results were. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of just being able to reproduce human level accuracy linkage, surely that's potentially possible. You have to be on site with that data, obviously. Yeah. But, um, yeah. and if you have connections to a linkage unit or an organization which does linkage, um, anyone? <laughs> in my, I mean, my experience was we had an ARC linkage project doing record linkage. I was at the credit bureau, and my colleague, who was the researcher in beta, the only the only thing he got out of the data matching in beta is that we are using rules. That's all they told him. End of story. And it's kind of they were so again, that matching to it. But it's really again that the shift in people owning their data. Um, I think if you would talk to people at Centrelink how they do the data matching for the robot that program, they're not going to tell you anything. I had some students last week in the course and they were made a bad joke and I, <laughs> they were very, they were very um, upset after that. So, um, it's, yeah, it's, um, so it's really, automated would be nice, but um, the shift in the way people in organizations think about the data, right? what Ian mentioned before, right? So, again, if something goes badly wrong, then that goes back five years. Right? Okay. Thank you. So, what's the <laughs> Yes, what's the
Um, we have one more talk for today, and then um, we'll close up, good pub, things like that. So um, please welcome Jacob um, and Babuo to um, give us a talk on multi-party linkage. And, and we have so many here. 